So here's where we're at. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Psalms 101. Today we're in Psalms 101, and the great refrain and resolution of Psalm 101, it comes in verse 2. We're going to just start right here, but then we'll work our way all the way through the psalm. It's this, I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. So if that resonates with you, the desire to walk in integrity within your spheres of influence, within those who, who know you well and maybe those who, who, who just meet you at first. If you desire to walk in integrity, if that resonates with you, then today's psalm is for you. And what I want to do to help us think meaningfully and deeply about the idea of integrity is I want to link it to this idea of instincts. So if you're taking notes today, let me just go ahead and give you this, the sermon summary. In one sentence, it is this. We are called to close the gap between our instincts and our integrity. We are called to close the gap between our instincts and integrity. Let me talk, there is a relationship between the two, and I just want to talk about both up front, and then we're going to jump into the psalm, and we're going to be ready to, for everything that the Lord has for us today. But first of all, I want to talk about what is an instinct. Well, an instinct is something you do that comes natural to you. Now, when you hear instinct, you may think about the animal kingdom. There are some very fascinating, even funny instincts out there in the animal kingdom. Have you ever thought about beavers, how they're builders, how they can take brush and they can build a shelter and they can build a home right on a riverbank somewhere? It's fascinating. That's their instinct to do that. Thought, ever thought about how birds, they're migrators? It gets cold. I'm going south. And some of you from the north can relate to that instinct as well, because maybe you came south when it, when it gets cold, or maybe you know somebody who does that. But additionally, dogs. So dogs are barkers. Dogs will be excited, or dogs will be startled, or sometimes anything at all may happen, and they will bark. Some of you have this dog. It's just bark. It's like any any mundane life event, there is barking that is happening. Those are instincts. And we all have instincts. We as humans have instincts. One of the ways that the Bible talks about our instincts is the flesh, something you do that comes natural to you. So some of us, let me just kind of talk about maybe some silly instincts, then we'll talk about maybe some more serious instincts. So we, some of you are morning people. You're just like uh, rise and shine, up with the rooster, um, and others of you, you're more of a night owl, okay? I won't poll the people and see where we're at, but we've got both in the room. Some of you, you get up early. Others of you, you prefer to stay up late. Others, the first thing that you think about in the morning, I can relate to this, is I got to get my coffee. You wake up and you, you need that coffee. Others, hey, we instinctively, this is just the moment we're in, we look at our phones. It's almost subconscious. It's just like that's where our attention goes. But the way that the Bible talks about instincts is that our instincts are broken, that we have sinful instincts. And so we, when given the choice between uh, sinfulness and godliness, we are naturally, instinctively going to trend toward what is wrong instead of what God says is right. And our sinful instincts can only be made new by the power of the gospel, by faith in Jesus. It's called being born again, by receiving the rerouting power of the Holy Spirit, when we receive Jesus by faith, he comes to indwell in our life and empower us to more instinctively align with the integrity of Christ. And apart from his enabling power and apart from his presence, we, we can't do it. But that's how we get to integrity, and that's the relationship with instincts. But let me talk a little bit about integrity. So what is integrity? Well, integrity is a math term. And it comes from this idea of an integer. So an integer is a whole number. So think 1, think 10, think 100. So it's a number that is all there, that is not fractured or, or not uh, in, in a decimal form. And so what we see with integrity is it means that you're all there. And what integrity shows us is that we're not partially in or divided in our commitments. But instead, one of the ways that the Bible talks about integrity would be with wholeheartedness. There's so much in scriptures that talks about seek the Lord with your whole heart. And one of the ways that the Bible talks about a lack of integrity is to have a divided heart, to have a divided interest. And 
If you think about this idea of an integer, and I'm not trying to sound like math class. That wasn't exactly my strong suit whenever I was going through school. But when you think about this idea of an integer, it actually makes sense because in an integer, there are no fractions. There's no partial numbers. A fraction, that's the word where we get fracture. So someone who lacks integrity is going to have a fractured desire. They're going to have fractured commitments. They're going to feel fracture in their life. And there's no decimals. That's where we get the word destroy from. So they're not going to choose things that are going to destroy, but they're, they're being built up and they're able to build up. And so this, this idea of integrity, this is the primary focus of Psalm 101. And here's what you need to know. This is a Psalm of David. David likely wrote this at the beginning of his reign, whenever he started as the king over Israel. And what happens when you start something? You have a lot of ideals. It's going to go this way. And David has a lot of ideals at this point. But then what happens to our ideals is we get hit with reality. I've heard it said that reality is what hits you whenever you are proven wrong or what validates you whenever you are proven right. And one of the realities about our sinful condition is that we have a hard time seeing reality clearly. And you can't be a person of integrity until you see reality clearly. And over time, what would happen is David's ideals would be met with the reality of his own brokenness and the impossibility of righteousness, which would prepare his heart for, his, for the need for a much greater king who would be able to fulfill this integrity and be the author of integrity. So what I want to do is I want to give you three instincts of integrity that we're going to talk about as we work through these eight verses in Psalm 101. And these three words come from one of my favorite Bible scholars who helps me interpret the Bible, helps me teach the Bible, Warren Wearsby. And so these three words are going to come out of some insights and takeaways that I learned from him. But let's personalize this for our church as we walk through. Number one instinct of integrity is this. It's devotion. And we're going to see devotion show up in verses 1 through 2. Now, what does devotion mean? Well, you might be thinking about waking up and reading the Bible and spending time with Jesus. But it's, it's definitely not less than that, but it's actually more than that. A helpful way to think about devotion is the sum of your desires and your dependencies. What do you want and what do you need? That's how David talks about it. Verse 1, he says, I will. Now, he, this is the first of eight I will resolutions that all have to do with integrity in these eight verses. And I refers to the Davidic king, David or a king who would come through his line. And what we see over redemptive history, and we see this through world history, is that kings and kingdoms will rise and fall. But what we see right here is an ideal standard for integrity that starts with leaders that moves out into the people that they influence. And so Psalm 101 is actually leadership 101. This is how godly leaders live and relate with integrity. And it's for those who are leading anything or, or ever want to lead anything. So I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless. So what do we see? Well, the first thing that we see is that people of integrity desire God. People of integrity desire God. I want you to notice how David talks about singing to the Lord. So if you know anything about David, you know that he was a musician. And one of the main ways that he would express his desires was through singing. And this is what the Psalms are. They are Israel's greatest hits. Maybe some of you grew up with now, that's what I call music. Or others of you, you knew the baptized version. Wow, that's what I call music. Well, this is the, the now, that's what I call music of ancient Israel. It was the songbook. It was the songs of Jesus. And so there's a lot of singing in here. And that's what David is doing to express his desire. So here's a fair question is, how do you know when your heart is really in something? Well, there's a few ways that you could know. You're laughing you're dancing, <laughs> you are singing. Those are all strong clues. By the way, did you know that people who regularly sing out loud in the shower are less stressed and have a higher pain tolerance? Won't forget that, huh? The effects of singing on the mind, the body, and the soul are not just biblical, they're also practical. And by the way, don't you just love it when science catches up with Scripture? 
It's like Scripture's been saying this for a really long time. Glad you guys made it to the party. But what does he sing about right here? Well, there's two things. He sings of steadfast love. So steadfast love, that phrase shows up 119 times in the book of Psalms, 245 times in the Old Testament. And that is a phrase that comes from the most often quoted verse in all of the Old Testament, which is Exodus 34, 6 and 7, which is, The Lord, the Lord, gracious and merciful, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness from generation to generation, a God of justice. So that's like the John 3, 16 of the Old Testament. The Old Testament writers love that verse. And a a fair question is, why are they so focused on this verse? Well, it's simple. It's because this is the greatest reason to sing. Because notice that it doesn't say, I will sing of your puppy love. It doesn't say, I will sing of romantic love. It doesn't say, I will sing of conditional love. No, this is the language that God used to describe his covenant love with his people to Israel. In the Exodus, as he led them out of Egyptian slavery with his strong hand and through the wilderness. And it's important to consider the the timing of this phrase where it comes in Exodus 34. That was after the people just blew it big time and bowed down and worshipped a golden calf that was lifeless. And so after that, after this epic failure, God comes and he says, oh, by the way, I'm a God of steadfast love. And even when you fail, I will be faithful. As 1 John 4 puts it, Perfect love casts out fear. So this is important because there's nothing that we could do. And this is the gospel, by the way. If somebody ever comes to you and says, all religions are basically the same. With all due respect, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know Christianity very well. Because while all religions might be superficially similar, Christianity is fundamentally different. But what the world trumpets is that all religions are fundamentally the same and only superficially different. And there's one word that separates Christianity from the pack, and it's grace. The grace of God towards sinners where we don't have to earn salvation. So God loves us before we're lovely. Um, But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the gospel. And so what that means for us is that on my worst day, I couldn't lose it when I'm in Christ, as Alan was talking about earlier. But on my best day, I couldn't earn it because it is only through the resume and the integrity of Jesus credited to me by faith that I have access to the Father. And and what that does is that gives us two things that we have to have in life. We need to have confidence and we need to have humility. So confidence, what, what do we need confidence around that our failure is not going to be fatal? So 1 John 4, 18, we love because Christ first loved us. What does that go on to say? Well, fear or perfect love casts out fear. And fear has to do with punishment. What are we afraid of? We're afraid that we're going to be punished. We're afraid that we're going to get caught. We're afraid that we're not going to make it onto the other side and be met with grace and forgiveness because when our head hits the pillow at night, we all know we're guilty. And we, we all know that we need it. And so we have confidence that our failure is not fatal, and that gives us victory over fear. But additionally, we have humility. And so humility is what's going to drive out the number one populator of hell, and that is pride. It lets us know that it's not because of my own good works that I'm able to stand before God. It is because of his steadfast love, and that's what David's singing about. But he also sings about justice. So here's, uh, here's a way to think about justice. Justice is served when something wrong is made right or when something right is kept right. So why do we get so upset whenever a person in a position of power, maybe it's a politician, maybe it's a public figure, maybe it's a pastor, maybe it's somebody who has power in your life, maybe it's a supervisor, whatever that may be, why do we get so upset? Well, there's a very simple reason most of the time It's because we feel like on some level justice is being withheld. And that's a slippery slope because until we view justice according to God's eyes, we're going to view justice according to our eyes. And it is often that we are wrong in our own sight as the Bible talks about. And so 
someone, uh, someone is withholding justice and it's upsetting. You know, we, the, our desire for justice, by the way, that comes to us from God. And here's what is very comforting. It's Psalm 145, verse 17. I want to show this to you. The Lord is righteous. He's just in all his ways and kind in all his words. So, and, and nowhere is that seen more clearly than in Jesus, who is the way. And as Paul puts it in Romans 3.26, another verse on justice, where he's talking about how Jesus took our place in life and death to give us life instead of death. Here's what he says. So that, why did he do that? He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, before the cross, Jesus was just. He was sinless. He was guiltless. But on the cross, he became our justifier by taking our sin debt onto himself and crediting his righteous record, his integrity, to our account by faith. You see, perfect justice is not a blind eye toward what is wrong or unjust. What happens is God God is, in in his perfect justice, he ends sin without ending sinners. And how is it that you do that? Well, it means that both sin and and sinners must be punished, but instead of punishing sinners, Jesus, who knew no sin, took on our sin debt, was punished in our place. And as Isaiah, as, as Isaiah 53, 6 says, by his wounds we are healed. I want to ask you, where do you turn for justice? Do you turn to some lesser love, to some lesser source than the perfect justice that is seen on the cross of Christ? Do you turn to yourself and take vengeance and justice into your own hands? Do you turn to some peer group who really determines what is right and what is wrong? Do you turn to the majority of people in our moment and in our culture? To be a Christian is to turn to Jesus for perfect justice. Because God's love and justice towards you, here's what it does. It produces new desires in you, and it shows up in what you sing. And you're like, well, what's that all about? Well, let me give you a personal example of this. I knew that I had become a Christian when I saw my instincts begin to incline to Jesus. When I saw my desires begin to incline to Jesus. And one of the most compelling evidences of that, and some of you might relate to this, is when Psalm chapter 40 verse 3 became true for me. I will put a new song in your mouth. And so before Jesus, there's this before and after picture right here. I was all about in the club with 50 Cent. But after Jesus, it was in Christ alone with passion music. I started listening and longing for and instinctively going toward music that was good, true, and right instead of music that was pulling me away from Jesus. And I wonder, here's a question on this for all of us, is... Where is that area for you? You know, maybe it's singing, but is there a clear area in your life where you are wholly and solely uh, dependent on God for help and for, for provision, where you desire God with your thoughts, your words, your actions? Well, what that is, is that's a sign of true devotion, and it's what leads us to integrity. But take a look at verse 2 as David keeps going. He says, oh, when will you come to me? So this psalm was likely written again at the beginning of King David's reign. And one of the first things that happens right there, you can go and read about this in 2 Samuel verse, or chapter 6, is David wants to bring what's called the Ark of the Covenant close to the palace. Because the Ark of the Covenant was like the hot spot of God's presence in the Old Testament. It was where the presence of God had covenanted with the people to dwell in its greatest density. And so if you've ever been trying to log on to the internet and you couldn't access Wi-Fi, you were disconnected, but you had a mobile hotspot maybe on your phone or locally, well, that's what the presence of God was representative of in the Ark of the Covenant. If I can get this hotspot of God's presence close to the palace then my palace is going to be marked by God's presence, and that was David's desire. So when he says, when will you come to me, he's talking about when will your presence come through the Ark of the Covenant. And what this shows us is that even in his early days as king, David understood this much, that there is no devotion to God 
apart from dependence on God. And so people of integrity desire God, but secondly, people of integrity depend on God. And so if you know anything about David's story, you know that he would need to depend on the Lord at every turn. And sometimes he did this better than others, but he would need to depend on the Lord for the humility to repent. He would need to depend on the Lord for the grace to forgive. He would need to depend on the Lord for the strength to persevere through chaos, through uncertainty, and through pain. He would also need to depend on the Lord for protection from predators and from enemies. And so what does David say? He says, oh, when will you come to me? And so that first question is, hey, where, where do you see evidence that you're desiring God? But this next question is, where do you see evidence of your need to depend on God? Where do you see evidence of looking to him for peace, looking to him for protection, looking to him for provision? Those are all evidences of a life that is inclining toward integrity. And that, that, de- that desire and that dependence, that's what enables us to join with David in the central resolution of this psalm. Here it is in verse 2. I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. So house is a simple way of describing those who you have influence over. And what David said is the people who I influence, who are closest to me, who look to me, and by the way, for David, it was millions of people. He had a lot of influence. There was a lot, there was a lot at stake. And when you influence a large group of people, there is more at stake with your integrity. There's more at stake with your devotion to the Lord. This is why the Bible talks so much about praying for leaders so that they, they will walk in devotion and lead well. But David, basically, he had resolved to steward his influence with integrity. And here's the thing about integrity. We, integrity does not mean perfection. Uh, integrity, what integrity means is that you, your instincts, where you are instinctively going, are more and more inclined toward the, the way of Christ, the integrity of Christ. And so over time, what's happening, the more that you walk in devotion to Jesus, the, the narrower that gap between your instincts and integrity begin to be. And I think there's a picture that I want to show you of kind of what this looks like between our instincts and our integrity. So let's just go ahead and let's put that up. I want you to see this. So devotion to Jesus, what does it do? It closes the gap. So if you, when you start as a Christ follower, that gap between your instincts and integrity is going to be wider because it takes. It, we follow Jesus over the course of a life, not all at once in one moment. Now, we follow him by faith all at once in one moment, and we're born again, but it takes time for that gap to close in. And so a way to think about a person of integrity, it's not that they're sinless, it's that they are starting to sin less. And you see that more and more over time. So narrowing the gap, it starts with devotion, but it continues with this. This is the next instinct of integrity. It is discernment. Discernment. This is a very important virtue. This is a gift that comes from the Holy Spirit. And here's why discernment is such a big deal. Because what discernment does is it brings wisdom and vision together in one place and in one person. So what is, what is wisdom? Wisdom is living God's way in God's world. So one of the ways that the culture would talk about wisdom would be street smarts. The way that the, the Bible would, would talk about it would be someone who is being sanctified, someone who is more and more walking out and living out the life of Jesus. So it's, 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 it's living God's way in God's world. But then vision, what is vision? Vision is the ability to see reality clearly. And here's the problem. Very few see reality clearly. What we do is we take how we feel, we take what we see, and we turn that into the reality that is in front of us. But the, the issue with that is that oftentimes we don't see it all. And oftentimes we don't feel things that are in alignment with the truth or with the situation. And so in order for us to have vision, we have to see reality clearly. And so a person of vision is one who sees more than others and one who sees 
before others. And this is discernment is so important because it brings these two together, and here's how. Because discernment is the ability to see what God sees, that's vision, and to live what God says, that's wisdom. Discernment is the ability to see what God sees with eyes of faith and to live what God says, that's wisdom. And it's one of the defining instincts of a person who is living a life of integrity. And where does discernment come from? Well, you don't get discernment before devotion. There's a logical progression to how this works. Devotion to the Lord is what's going to give you a more keen discernment in life. So look at how David puts it in verse 3. This is where this all comes from. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. So in other words, he's saying looking will lead to hooking. And the longer I look, the more likely that I will be hooked. And I want to make sure that I am going to look on things that are not going to bait me into the ways of the enemy or bait me into the darkness and and leave me as a casualty of sin. I want to look at things that are good, that are true, that are right. And there's two, really two things that come to mind right here when David talks about something that's worthless. I think about worthless pictures and worthless pursuits. So worthless pictures. You know, lust did not start with the advent of pornography. Now, lust started back in the beginning whenever there was a sneaky serpent who enticed Adam and Eve to look at the tree, to look at the fruit that was forbidden. Humankind was not on the hook because of sin and experiencing the curse that comes from sin until we took the look at the very thing that God said have nothing to do with that. And so I want to ask you this question. Where are you looking? Are you looking at things that are hooking you into sin, that are leading you astray? Or are you looking upon the beauty of Jesus? Are you looking upon the the building and the blessing of his church? Are you looking upon his goodness in your life with thanksgiving? Um, And and so there's there's worthless pictures, but there's also worthless pursuits. So uh, a good cross-reference right here would be Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. And so how do you know what you're seeking first? Well, there's actually a very simple way to know it. Where is your time going and where is your money flowing? That answers the question. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Also where your time goes, that's where your heart will be also. And what this says is this says whether or not our pursuits are building the kingdom of God or building the kingdom of man. Because when, when, the, when the psalmist used the word worthless, how do you define worth? Well, the the biggest way that you could define worth is value over time. You know, some things will be valuable in one moment that won't be valuable 10 years from now. But value over time, what what holds value over time for all eternity? Only two things, the souls of people and the word of God. And so a worthwhile pursuit is going to be driven and defined by winning the souls of people into the kingdom of God and by ordering our life around the word of God. And what we see is that when we build our lives and pursue other things that are less than this and we organize our life around this, it's not just a failure of discernment. It can be fatal to our integrity. As Colossians 3, 2 says, set your minds on things that are above. As Hebrews 12 says, Fix your eyes on Jesus. I've heard it said before that for every look we take at our sin, we need to take 10 looks at Christ who can cover it. So take a look at verse 4 and let's see how David continues. He says, A perverse heart shall be far from me. So perverse means twisted. Let me ask you this. Who's ever played the game Twister before? Anybody in here? It's a silly game. Our, uh, it's, it's one of those things that a little, the older you get, the less you enjoy it, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> leave that there. But how do you win Twister? 
Well, you get untwisted and untangled from the other people who would otherwise make you fall. And so how do you win and how do you find a life of integrity? Well, what David is saying is that you have to untwist and untangle from this enemy and from those groups of people who are leading you to fall and who are doing things that would otherwise lead you away from the beauty of Christ. And the way we go through life and the way we end our life with integrity, it is to untwist and untangle from anything that would cause us to fall away from Christ. And the way that happens, verse 4 goes on, I will know nothing of evil. So he's not saying that he's ignorant of evil. He's saying that he's, he wants to be innocent of evil. So the difference between ignorance and, and innocence, it's very important. Ignorance means I don't know and I don't want to know. Ignorance is bliss until it leads to brokenness. And it always does It's saying, I don't want to see reality. I don't want to see clearly. It's the opposite of discernment. But then innocence is different. Innocence sees and knows about opportunities to lie, to lust, to lash out, and where those things lead, but discernment keeps you innocent. The way that our innocence is protected is from discernment. And discernment comes from devotion from the Lord. Take a look at verse 5. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. And you're like, well, that's pretty hard. Well, think about Romans 6.23. It says the wages of sin is death. So this is an Old Testament way of saying that the wages of sin, the wages of breaking God's law, the wages of living a life that is turned in on oneself is death. But then he goes on, whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart... I will not endure. Well, that sounds a lot like what Jesus says in Matthew 20, verse 16, where those who put themselves first will end up last, and those who are ready to take the lowest seat and go last are going to end up first. So what does a discerning instinct look like toward these two vices that David sets out right here in these verses? Slander and pride. I want to talk about this for just a moment. Let's start with slander. So when someone starts to tear another person down, you quickly shut it down. That is the biblical discerning response. When someone starts to tear another person down, you quickly shut it down. And here's a conflict concept that is pretty much universal. This comes out of Scripture. Assume the best, address the rest. That's the biblical way to go about misunderstandings. That's the biblical way to go about maybe some offense that's taken. But here's what the culture does. Instead of assuming the best and, address, and addressing the rest, it's assume the worst and attack with words. And what does a discerning person do in the face of slander? Two things that I want to show you. They deal with it biblically, and they distance from it personally. So deal with it biblically. Here's what that looks like hey, I can tell you feel strongly about this person's actions. Have you spoken to them in private about it? Maybe there's a good reason for that thing they did that has upset you. Until you go here, we are, we, we are venturing outside of discernment, and we're actually moving closer toward destruction, and we're in the territory of slander. But then, If there's no ears for that, if there's no interest in that, you distance from it personally because we're called to build up, not to tear down. And when you get somebody in your life who is not helping you do that, then it is wise, it is good, it is true, it is right, it is discerning to put some distance right there and say we can't be close. So that's slander. How about pride? So discerning people, it says, won't endure pride in themselves or in others. So here's a way to think about pride. Pride is like body odor. If, <laughs> if you've ever had that moment when you're out in public and you're just like, I, you know, something's off right here. Okay. The, the, you do the sniff check, right? And the first thing that you do is you make sure it's not you, right? If you have any category of self-awareness, you just want to make sure, I hope that's not me. If so, I need to get out of here really quick. This is going to get cut short. 
But when you realize, hey, it's not you, then you try to figure out, like, who is that person? <laughs> and you, you try to have some appropriate distance between you and, and them. And here's the thing. Uh, pride is spiritual body odor. We're all prideful, but people of integrity deal with pride differently. Instead of enduring pride, we'll distance from pride. Now, what does that look like? It looks like three things. Repentance, forgiveness, forbearance. You need all three. So repentance deals with pride in the mirror. This is what you do when you're wrong. And if no one can tell you you're wrong, you're definitely wrong. So we, we need to be just as quick of repenters as we are forgivers. It's a sign of spiritual health. So repentance and then forgiveness. This is the grace that pours out when others are wrong, right? When someone sins or offends in some way. And then there's forbearance. Guys, pride is predictable and pride is present in every relationship. And if you cut off every relationship just because of pride, you will have no relationships and it's a picture of your pride. And forbearance is what helps you go the distance with people who are also broken sinners. And this is how you deal with it. But here's the last instinct of integrity I want to give to you. We see the progression of integrity. We see how devotion produces discernment, which leads to this last one, really good decisions. Really good decisions. This is going to show up in verses 6 through 8. Take a look at verse 6. I will look with favor on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless. Now, blameless does not mean bloodless. Blameless does not mean totally innocent. It's another word for integrity that says, I'm not sinless, but I'm sinning less. I will walk in the way that is blameless. That person shall minister to me. Minister is just another word for, for serving. Verse 7, no one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. So decisions. Does anybody have some decisions to make? Any big decisions to make? Research shows that the average adult makes 30,000 decisions a day. To, what to wear, where to walk, what to eat, which route to drive, and some decisions are a lot less consequential than others. But what we see is that there are those decisions in life that have big consequences, and we want to get it right. David talks about two categories of big decisions, big types of decisions that he shows us that he needed to make, that we need to make, and here they are. The first one is relational decisions, or you could just say people decisions. You know, people of integrity make good people decisions. And let me interact with this for a little bit because this was written by a leader for those who desire to lead. Only the blameless shall minister to me. No one who practices deceit or lies, he says, shall continue before my eyes. So in other words, what he's saying is people of integrity will only let other people of integrity inside their inner circle. So this is not saying that it's the only people that they will interact with, but it's the only people who they will give great weight to their thoughts and perspectives because they know that it's weighed against the integrity of Christ. So this is the people that you share news with first. This is the people who you go to for guidance. These are the people where you turn when you need to be ministered to. Uh, furthermore, here's another mark of good people decisions. They don't give in to people just because of how loud they are, who they know, or how much money or influence they have. So someone who's making good people decisions, especially from a standpoint of a leader, understands, hey, I, I need to love, possibly lead this group of people, but I don't owe favor and I don't owe friendship to just anybody within this group of people. So you've heard that truism, show me your friends, I'll show you your future, it's also true, show me your friends and I will show you the quality of your decisions. 1 Corinthians 15, says, bad company corrupts good integrity. And, you know, I've been there as I look back on the fallout and the, the brokenness in my own life over the years. The times when I got in the biggest trouble growing up was when I had brought people close to me who made sport of sin. <laughs> 
and pushed me farther and farther away of Jesus. And you know, some of you, you're nodding your head because you know exactly what this is like. And you know that that did not go well and it does not go well. So I want to say a word to parents with children under your home. Be very careful with who you allow your kids to get close with. A word to uh, students. Be very, very careful who you turn to for a good time. A word to singles. Be very, very, very careful who you date and who you marry. And I want to say, say a moment on, on marriage and dating for just a moment because here's what's supposed to happen in a, a godly relationship. You have God as the goal and you have two people and you're moving together toward God. What happens when you move together toward God? You're closer and closer and closer. But if you're moving toward God and the goal line of Jesus, but someone else is going right here, then what's going to happen is you're going to get farther and farther away or they're going to pull you off course. And it's so important for you to have devotion, discernment that leads to good people decisions right here. You can't say enough about it. But if we're being honest, some of you, the reason why you have the financial, the reason why you have the spiritual, the reason why you have the social anxiety in your life is because of the people who you have brought close, who are pushing you away from Jesus. And I just want to ask you this question. What relational boundaries do you need to put in place in order to have peace? Because one of the principles of Scripture is that we are to live peaceably with all people. But you can't live peaceably with all people if the people you bring close are into making war on the truth, on your faith. It's food for thought. Verse 8, morning by morning I will destroy, that's another word for silence, all the wicked in the land, cutting off, that's another word for killing, all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. So morning by mer morning refers to the king's involvement in the justice system. So morning by morning, eastern kings would go out to the city gate and people would come to them and they would bring their legal situational cases to be heard by the king and he would pronounce judgment and he would hear these cases. And what he's saying right here is, I want those judgments to be good, right, and true with these difficult situations that are being brought. And so this is the second big type of decision that we have to make. It's situational decisions. Situational decisions. People of integrity do really well with complicated situations. And you know, I'm up here speaking to a room full of people broadly applying the Word of God to a host of situations. But I could about guarantee that if we were just to sit down and we were just to talk face-to-face, -face, maybe over coffee, most of you in here would say, I've got some pretty tough situations that I'm faced with, and I've got some very difficult decisions that I need to make. How did David make good situational decisions? Well, maybe this is reassuring. He didn't always. <laughs> I mean, he a major categorical lapses of judgment that led to great consequence. He permitted some very unsavory sins to happen within his own home with his kids. He committed adultery. He ordered the death of one of his soldiers that might otherwise prove him guilty. But here's what I want you to see. You know, we, sometimes we high side on David. It's like, oh man, he was a great sinner. But here's what we need to understand. Over the course of David's life, he was an even greater repenter. Over David's life, he walked with integrity of heart. He expanded a kingdom. He wrote psalms. He triumphed over enemies. And it was his devotion to the Lord which gave him the discernment to make those good decisions. And in the foreground of those decisions was a heart of repentance because he knew just how much he needed the Lord. Here's the reality of Psalm 101. None of us, including David, can actually do it. What it is is it's one big call to repentance for all of us because even the most morally commendable in the room today will only live some of your life with integrity. But only Jesus was the one who lived the sum of his life with integrity. It was only Jesus who was fully devoted to the Father's 
will. It was only Jesus who was fully discerning of reality. It was only Jesus who made every right decision. And it's, here's the grace. By grace through faith, he credits his integrity to us. So 2 Corinthians 5.21, this is a summary. God made him who was of the utmost integrity to be treated like someone who lacked integrity so that in him we might receive as a gift his record of integrity. And it's beautiful when you understand that devotion to the Lord, it can narrow the gap over time because if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, given new instincts. The old is gone, the new has come, but it will never close the gap. There will always be a sinful instinct in all of us, and this is why the way that we need to see that visual that I showed you earlier about instincts and integrity and the gap between the two, put this up. Let's take a look and see what Jesus does. Jesus' steadfast love covers the gap. So there's always going to be something about your instincts that is going to be distant from God's integrity. But in those moments whenever you fail, in those moments whenever you fall, you can place your hope on the finished work of Jesus and know that his integrity by faith somehow counts for you and that Jesus' death that covers the gap gives us a devotion that can help us close the gap. It's all about Jesus. It is only by Jesus. And for that reason, we must turn to Jesus. Would you bow your heads, open your hearts? I want to pray for us. I want to fix our eyes on Jesus. Father, we look to you to be the author and perfecter of our integrity. We know that there is a gap between who we ought to be and who we actually are. And in our own power, we could never completely close that gap. But because of your grace, you cover the gap through the cross. So Lord, give us godly instincts. Pray, I pray that we would want what you want and that we would hate what you hate and that we would become more and more like your great son, Lord, we pray that you would stir up our devotion to you, that you would give us the discernment that we need to make the decisions that are good, right, and true. We look to you, we love you, and we long to live for you. Make us a people of integrity. May we say, I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.